from the city of brotherly love, Philadelphia to around the globe. You're listening to Shark Bite Biz, your exclusive place for business strategy, sales, marketing, and tech in the roaring 20s. And now, here's your host, David Strausser. Welcome to the newest episode of Shark Bite Biz. I'm your rock star wannabe host, David Strausser, and this is your place to learn how to grow a business during complete chaos. Today, we have a special episode for you all. I've got an interview with somebody that I really, really look up to and admire. Somebody that is a CEO, a thought leader, and somebody that you are all familiar with. First though, remember, if you're watching us on YouTube, join the channel. Three bucks a month, you can become a baby shark and it helps us produce bigger and better shows. But if that's not your thing, don't worry. We get it. Got you covered there. Go to deadhousecoffee.com. That's deadhousecoffee.com. Use code shark at 20% off of your order and everything from those sales, the proceeds directly help build this into a bigger and better show. Back to today's stellar show. I'm going to keep my intro short because I'm so excited to show you all this interview. We all know this person for her on-screen persona and through her reporting, books, her writing. But today, we get a glimpse behind the curtain to see what the recipe is that goes into being a successful leader in this very day and age. I'm truly honored to have our guest on the show today as she has been in the forefront of reporting most major news stories that have happened for nearly half of my life. She just testified in front of Congress a few weeks ago and is doing so much at one time. I think it'll just blow most people's minds with how she's able to multitask and work on so many different projects at one time. She embodies the words a driven individual. So who is today's guest? Oh, so glad you asked. None other than the amazing Soledad O'Brien. Soledad O'Brien is an award-winning journalist, speaker, author, and philanthropist who anchors and produces the Hearst Television political magazine program, Matter of Fact, with Soledad O'Brien. O'Brien, founder and CEO of Soledad O'Brien Productions, also works for HBO Real Sports, the PBS NewsHour, WebMD, and has authored two books. She has appeared on networks Fox and Oxygen and anchored and reported for NBC, MSNBC, and CNN. She has won numerous awards, including three Emmys, the Peabody Award, an Alfred I. DuPont Prize, and the Gracie. Newsweek magazine named her one of the 15 people who make America great. With her husband, she is founder of the How Her Fall Foundation that helps young women get to and through college. Make sure you follow her on Twitter at Soledad O'Brien. So, hey, I'm going to shush up. Let's bring Soledad on in here. Personal growth. Soledad, welcome to Shark Bite Biz. You just became Shark Bait. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Nice <laughs> to see you. Thanks for having me. Oh, no problem. Such an honor. And I think everybody kind of knows who Soledad O'Brien is. I gave you an extensive intro to this clip, but can you put it in your own words? What makes Soledad sure. Soledad? <laughs> I don't know about that. That sounds very uh, existential. Um, mm -hmm. But I would say uh, mm -hmm. I'm a, a reporter. I'm a journalist. I run a small business. I'm the CEO of a production company. Uh, and um, and I am a documentarian. So I also, you know, make films uh, and have about each of those things has about 10 jobs under each one of them. So I run around right. like a little bit of a maniac. Uh, I'm a mom. I'm a wife. I live in New York City. When I'm not in New York City, I'm uh, down in Florida. <laughs> that's kind of me in a nutshell. No, that that's great. And one of the things that we like to focus on on this show is personal growth, career growth. 
did you grow up knowing that you've always wanted to be in this field or no. did it just find you? No, a little bit uh, in between. I, I really wanted to be a doctor when I was growing up. I was very interested in medicine. And when I was growing up in Long Island, in the, I was in high school in the eighties, mm -hmm. you know, it was a very, it was a very prestigious thing to be a doctor. It paid well. Uh, I think it was sort of in the community considered to be an important job. I think that's changed a lot. Not that yeah. it doesn't pay well and it's not an important job, but I think so many things have made, um, medicine much more challenging for the providers yeah. Uh, yeah. just how you bill people and the amount of time etc cetera, etc cetera. so i think yeah that, we've talked that, to a lot of people on this show and they were talking about how it, it's pretty complicated right now yeah it is and it also i think emotionally complicated too yeah. so um but i wanted to be a doctor i, I was taking pre-med courses actually with my sister at the time and she sort of pointed out to me that i wasn't particularly passionate about it i've just kind of been like clunking toward it my whole childhood, right. working in a pharmacy, working in a nursing <laughs> home, et cetera, et cetera, right? Yeah. So uh, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And so I got an internship at a TV station because you just kind of could at the time. Uh, right. They don't really let you do that anymore. Now you, it's a much more onerous process. But then mm -hmm. internships were, if you got an internship, they would just give you credit for school. So right. you know it didn't really count for, for, I was in school, didn't count for a whole lot. And uh, I started working there and I loved it. And so I think it, I just kind of stumbled into something that really hit all the things that I was actually passionate about, having just figured out that I was pretty nervous about being having it pointed out to me that the thing I thought mm -hmm. I was going to do, I was just overtly not that passionate about. Yeah, yeah. A lot of people, they... I, I don't know. It's weird. You hear this all the time. People, and we've had some successful people like Jack Douglas, the legendary music producer, telling their stories about how they, they think they want this one path. And it turns out that they're just not passionate about it. And almost by accident or happenstance, it, it's like the their, their true path kind of crosses them. And that's when they realize it at that moment. And that's when they just go for it and grab onto it. Yeah, I wouldn't say mine was by happenstance because I really did sit down and think about, well, if I'm not going to go to medical school, what am I going to do? What are the things that I'm good at? What are my talents? And I had sort of a small list of those things that I thought could be the next runner up. So it wasn't like, oh, one day I mm -hmm. wandered into a TV studio. It just didn't work <laughs> like that. Um, but I, I definitely, the things that I thought would make me a great doctor turned out to be the things that I think made me a good reporter. So I thought I like people and I'd like sitting down with patients. Well, you know, actually I like people and I like telling their stories and, right. you know, good doctors should be good scientists and not people who are sitting there just holding your hand. So right. I do think sometimes those things that we think what we're, what we're reading into ourselves and like, Oh, this means I should be X. Sometimes I think maybe we're misreading it a little. Right, right, right. Understood. So before I get into a little bit more serious questions, I have to ask a fandom question that you've probably heard a billion times. Okay, you've done a lot of interviews, you've done a lot of stories over all the years. What's one that stands out to you as one of the most memorable or favorite? Uh, I don't know that I have a favorite. Um, I have a couple of memorable ones that I, I think probably Probably the toughest one was when I, I was interviewing a guy who, uh, in the wake of the Southeast Asian tsunami, I was based mm -hmm. in Thailand, and we were um, in this resort, and and people had been, um, he was getting his son out, they were going swimming, and it was early in the morning when the tsunami mm -hmm. struck, so the kid was, they had just been slathering him with sunscreen, the weather was perfect, and all of a sudden, this wave came up, and he was holding on to his son, but he was worried that he, because he was covered in sunscreen, he was very slippery. So uh -huh. he tried to adjust his position and the sun popped out of his arms oh. and floated away. And because they were in the middle of the tsunami uh, in, in the, the, the wave, basically, he said, you know, he could remember hitting the tops of palm trees as they were floating oh. down this river. And I think it just was, you know, to watch. So he was on the air to mm -hmm. basically beg people if they saw his son you know, to try to keep an eye out for him. And he was wow. three, his son was three. And he kept saying to me, you know, but he's wearing water wings, those little things you put on, you know, the arms. Like the little kid. floaties, right? He's wearing water wings. So I think he might be okay. You know, and the tsunami had gone at 70 feet, you know, of yeah. water, a wall of water. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. And I just remember, it just was such a sad moment. I mean, sometimes I think where 
you feel like you have more information than the person. Mm -hmm. Like you just knew that had a terrible ending that had a terrible ending. And so I think um, I just remember being so sad and I, I finished that interview and I was crying and I was trying my hardest to, to do the best I could for him. It was really, it just was sad. And that's happened to me a couple of times, you know, when I covered a lot of tragedies where people would just break your heart, you know, people in nine 11, Mm -hmm. you'd say, but you just saw the tower just collapsed. And they'd say, oh, no, no, no. You know, my my boyfriend has to be in there. He must be yeah. alive because if he's not alive, then my life is over. So yeah. he must be alive. You know, just so I, I think those things really kind of give you a good sense of the of the scope of a person of a tragedy that is so massive, right. but how it has this, in, this individual impact that's just so intense and so deep. Uh, so I would put those among some of the, the more difficult Definitely. I mean, just hearing the the story that you're retelling me, I, I don't know, maybe it's just my emotional side because I do have a three-year-old right now, but uh, you know, it, it just, it, it's sad. It's a it really a tragic break. story. So when you get into a story like that, does, does it kind of validate in your mind? Like, Hey, this is why I do what I do so I can tell these oh, stories gosh, and get it out. Yeah. Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah. I think that's exactly it. I think, I think it's important. I, I, when I left doing daily news, part of it was because it just didn't feel like I had to go on certain stories. Like sometimes I'd be sent on things and I just would feel like, but why am I here? Right. You know, there's literally 60 other cameras. Mm-hmm. Like, why am I here? What, you know, I, I want to work on those things that I can bring a perspective to, or I have right. some insight in, or, or I have something to add. But I need to be on this plane because the way I'm going to, you know, report on this story is going to be a little bit different. And I think that has been a little, um, uh, you know, that to me was, um, yeah, I think that 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 I think makes you feel like the job is important and worth doing and, and worthwhile because you're there and you have a job to do, to, which yeah. for me was always elevating people's stories. Oh, no, that that's great info. And again, that's heart touching that that story. So. Right now, I don't know if you've seen on the news at all, but we're in the midst of a pandemic. Have you heard about this COVID thing? Yeah, I've been hearing about this thing. I've been wearing a mask for a while. I was wondering what that was about. (laughs) Yeah, exactly, right? So, you know, this has forced a lot of us, you know, working professional type people to have to work from home. Uh, I noticed one of the first things I noticed when, when we were chatting on Twitter is you're profile bio reads working mom right there um, quote unquote only thing you have person i have four yeah. kids my oldest uh my, my boys are in high school but my girls are in the first and second year of college okay okay so how has that been you working from home all the time during this pandemic are they studying from home then at all hybrid they, at all they, 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 they yes they've all sort of cycled back in as school open and closes or a good example would be for my, one of my daughters who was in college, one daughter didn't even start till January. So she was okay. home and she's, she's been home for the last few weeks. Uh, she got her wisdom teeth pulled. And so Ooh. she was just here recovering. And then it was like, <laughs> it's all remote anyway. Yeah. I might as well just stay just because the semester see. ends and it begins again. They have to go through school through the summer. So mm-hmm. it begins again on May 12th. The other daughter, a good, a good example would be over Halloween. She said, you know, everybody in her, apartment building is kind of like a dorm you know just like everyone right. it's, a, it's not a dorm but it's kind of a dorm right and she said there's going to be so many parties and i'm so you know i know that if i'm just here either i have to sit here by myself in my apartment hearing everybody else go to parties right. or i should just come home and hang out so that's what she would do she would just she lives uptown so she would just come home pretty easily and that well that's kind of a consistent thing they would sort of go in and out as it seemed mm-hmm. to make a lot of sense or if they had friends right. who were coming back who who they didn't think were really quarantining when they should you know they would leave and they would just come home for a couple of weeks while those people would work through their right. quarantine and then they'd go back um and so and and you know i think also just as everybody knows online school is hard because even the ones who are at school oh, yeah. it's still remote it's just remote but at school yeah so I think that that's yep. been a little challenging. That, that, that's been a, a strange experience. I've heard that from my daughter, who's eight, and then I have an 18-year-old as well, too, Pancho. Uh, he's actually the editor of the podcast. He's amazing. And he has told me, like, it's weird. I'll go to these classrooms, and sometimes, you know, it's just the, like, monitors and or substitute teachers sitting in there, but the teacher's remote. And 
that that's a crazy experience, you know, and here I'm thinking like, where was this stuff when I was in high school, you know, 20 years ago, I would have loved that. No, you wouldn't have. I don't think, <laughs> yeah, I think yeah, I mean, I know. you would have for a week, right? Yeah. But for a week. When it gets into a year, it just gets old yeah, and it gets yeah. exhausting. So, that, well, I think my kids have done a really good job dealing with it. And we've been very lucky. We have working internet mm -hmm. and they have decent yeah. laptops because they've had to for school. And so <laughs> that takes you a long way. But I, I think psychologically, it's just, it's just draining. I, you know, right? you've been on your fifth Zoom call of the day and you're just done. <laughs> Sometimes I'll just yeah. turn the camera off and I'll tell people like, I just can't, I don't want to say don't, don't do that to the interview is over. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes you're like, I'm, I, why, why are we looking at each other? Let's just do this by phone. So yeah, I, I'm school. very sympathetic. I'm very <laughs> sympathetic for students. I mean, it's just, it's exhaust. It's mentally exhausting. Well, what about the work-life balance now that, I mean, you're doing a lot of things. Has that impacted? Because I imagine you're still probably working from home more maybe than you were before. Yeah, I think productivity is up. And I think I know why, because there's nowhere to go. You know, it's yeah. not like I'm going to leave here and run out to dinner with friends or I'm going to mm -hmm. go and join someone for lunch or, you know, we just there's, you know, and that'll change as New York, certainly New York City opens more. Um so yeah, I definitely am working from home and, and I would say I work from home more. Part of it is, mm -hmm. you know, we're not commuting. Right. So, so you, you get up at seven, you take a shower, you get dressed and you work, you know? Yeah. Uh, and then you know, at been. the end of the day, you know, you're not running to catch a train. You're not running to miss the traffic. You're, you know, and, and I have found that it really can extend your, your day. It, it can make for a very long day. One thing I've had to do with some of my employees is to really tell people, you know, like, no, 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 you need to, you need to take off in the middle of the day. Like you cannot work all day, mm -hmm. just not good. Just because you can, and you're sitting at your desk in your home, doesn't mean you have to answer your phone and be working. Right. And so I think reminding people of that is really important. That's, that's exactly how I am. I manage a team for Vision 33 throughout the Northeast. We do high-end tech during my day job. And I'm the, the same way. I am very, I guess you could say task orientated rather than you got to work nine to five. It's like, right. hey, you know, come in and out as you need to. As long as the tasks are done, I'm good. I don't need you to work eight hours direct. In fact, I think the nine to five work hour is pretty antiquated. Yeah. Do you think that's come in the case? I completely do. And I do think, again, I don't think there's a lot of silver linings in a pandemic, yeah. but I do think we have forced everyone to acclimate to a big shift in how work can be done, right? All simultaneously. Right. So you no longer have, well, there are two people joining us remotely and I'm not really yeah. sure how do we dial them in? And I don't know, where are they again? And oops, we forgot to dial them in. I mean, that's usually what, or frequently what can happen when you have just one yeah. or two people who aren't in the office and they're sort of, you know, now you had every single person had to be done, which yep. meant that the technology had to actually support what you were trying to do. It couldn't be yep. just a decent or okay connection. It has to be a great connection because we're going to do this again tomorrow with everybody. And we're going to do it again the next day with everybody. So, so I yeah. think everybody started investing in their tech and investing in their various applications that were going to allow them to communicate better and more and more efficiently. And also just at a better level, you know? Yeah. And so I think, um, I think that that has been certainly a silver lining of a horrible pandemic. Um, but I, I, I think it also has allowed us to rethink, like, when do you work best? And, mm -hmm. you know, it, I, I certainly don't think I do a nine to five straight through. Yeah. I much prefer, I'm much better in the morning. I'd rather yeah. be up at seven doing a bunch of stuff, 10 o'clock, take a break, eat yep. something, maybe go work out, <laughs> start up again. You know, I mean, again, you know, why not? Working why in not? spurts. I, exactly. I think that's how to maximize it because it also gives you a minute to refresh. You know, like maybe I have, now this is pre-pandemic. I used to do it this way too. Uh, you know, say I had to go out for a breakfast lunch or a breakfast meeting uh, and then maybe I'd work to 11 a.m. and then I disappear to go to my daughter's dance class or whatever for three hours and then I'm back, but it's okay. Cause I'm going to a network meeting this evening as well too. So it kind yeah. of all balances out, but again, I think it depends on the talent, the people that you have work in those positions, because you have to be able to trust them that they're just not totally disappearing. Well, and also the job, right? Yeah. I mean, obviously there's some jobs that actually, no, nope, we need someone to staff this desk from nine to five. That's the yeah. job. Yep. Uh, and and certainly a lot of the stuff that we do for our creative teams, 
they, I, I want them working when they feel creative. You yeah. know, some people, I'm amazing at 7 a.m., but for a lot of people, like, <laughs> they need to sleep in till, you know, later in the morning. Yep. I'm okay with that. Start your day later. I, I'm with you. It doesn't really matter. But mm -hmm. again, as long as you hit those deliverables, that's obviously not possible for every single job. Oh, yeah, definitely. Definitely. So you obviously have a full plate. I think you're probably nonstop compared to most people, what they do during a day. How have you personally had to innovate then during the pandemic? It's mm, a great question. I mean, it doesn't feel like innovation to me. I think it's mm -hmm. really acting on the things that I know. I'm, I've gotten much better. I eat a lot better, uh, partly because I'm home all day. And if you, you know, when mm -hmm. I started, I probably gained 10 pounds just, just oh, coming, you know, going. I did the COVID-15. Of course. Right. Yeah. Uh, and so, and, but I got actually better, like, since I was going to be grazing, let's have the fridge full of like decent food and what did I want to mm -hmm. eat? So I got a little smarter about that. I, I knew that all along. I don't think I ever really did it. And then the other thing I think I've done well, same thing with exercise. Like I just started building it in and that everybody would have to work around, you know, my schedule on that. And again, most of my stuff is done early in the morning. So 8 a.m. I'm working out or 9 a.m. I'm horseback riding, something like that, which means, you know, my day can start at early seven, you can get me or 10 yeah. when I'm back, you know, there's lots of time in between. So I think my innovation wasn't very innovative. It was just, if I'm going to work a really long day, I need to make sure I get it. A day where I get nothing done but Zoom calls is very mm -hmm. depressing. It, it uh, needs to be a yeah. day where I worked out, where I had a meal that I made and I took 30 minutes to make it if I want to, that I went horseback riding because that's my sport that I like to do and I could squeeze it in and I could fit it in my calendar. That's so actually solid advice be, right there. Yeah. That That's solid advice because I think too many people think straight up just about business himself, like, oh yeah, I scored five Zoom calls today. You know, I'm just hitting a couple. Of, but then are you really being fulfilled? Are you being complete as well too? And I think that's where what you're saying, you know, like, hey, I, I do my workout, I do my my own lunch, I horseback riding, whatever it is, that's where it's actually completing you. Cause I think sometimes people are short sighted and they forget to do what makes them happy too. Yeah. And listen, I love work. I, I love it, but I don't know that you can sustain a ridiculous path without throwing in some of those things that are fulfilling and, 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 you know, take a break and make your day. And so, yeah, no, I, I think you're exactly right about that. And that's been very important to me this past week. I've been shooting. So I've been traveling a ton last week and this week I've been on the road just a ton crazy. Lots of shooting. Wow. Good. Interesting projects. Really like them. Yeah. But it also has kind of put my little world into a little bit of a kilt, you know, we were a little off kilter here. Um, for example, I flew in from Florida this morning on a 6 a.m. Wow. flight, which meant I left my house at 4 a.m. Wow. <laughs> um, you know, and so, and then I will, I'll go to Atlanta tomorrow morning for two days for another shoot. And then I'll fly out to California for an event and I'll take the red eye back on Sunday, right? Like that's just ridiculous. So that's fine. That's a week of just mm -hmm. crazy. I think we've done one, two, three. It'll be four shoots over the entire week. Wow. Um, all great, you know, but right. then you end that week and I'm red eyeing it back so I can go to my daughter's little horse show. And then you start again with, yep, now we're back on track. <laughs> we're back right, to right, right. going to the gym and working out and eating well and having meetings <laughs> and having a, some some boundaries around right. what could be, um, you know, being in the, you know, working out of your home office, uh, right. you know, 14 hours a day. So let's jump into content creation, because one thing I've, I mean, we have about 90 episodes of this podcast that came out. And one thing we've heard from a lot of subject matter experts throughout the whole show since episode one is that now is the time because you're not traveling as much as you used to and things like that. Now is the time to create content. You mean, it, do you think it's wise for business people, creators, young entrepreneurs to use this extra time to do things like that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, again, Whew, you just validated adds, my podcast. <laughs> if, it, if it adds value, you know, I think some people also might, examine it and say, no, it's, this is not what we should be doing or right. not what the CEO should be doing. And maybe mm -hmm. it should be handed off to somebody else to do, but yeah, you know, it's, it's exactly what I tell students, journalism students, especially because they're, they're 
a lot of time is when they're in college. And I'm Mm -hmm. like, you should start a podcast. And I don't care if you have six people who listen to it and it's your mom, your dad, your cousin, (laughs) your friend, literally like what a great opportunity to work on your craft because it's not about the audience. It's about what voice do you hear in your head? How do you get Mm -hmm. it out? What do you want to talk about? What, what what can sustain 90 episodes? What can sustain three episodes before everybody Mm -hmm. loses interest? And so, you know, it's that idea of when you end up with a window where you're not sprinting for a plane and you're not traveling, a lot of that is college or you're Mm -hmm. stuck at home with a pandemic. Like what can you do in that time? I'm always loathe though to suggest like oh the pandemic is a great time to right. lose 20 pounds and you know <laughs> learn to become a gourmet chef and how come you haven't Marie kondo your entire closet because it's a good time <laughs> right. to organize or you know I mean obviously yeah. I think for a lot of us it's like you know what some days you're just going to get through it like it's going to mm-hmm. be tough and your kids are just going to get through it you're going to do the best you can listen I, I have so few cooking skills but I can throw some tater tots in an air fryer and (laughs) we'll get through. We love tater tots. Yeah. (laughs) America's greatest food. I don't know, you know, so I'm always reluctant to sort of give people a sense Mm -hmm. of like, this is how you make yourself better. I I think it's hard, Uh, but I do think there are opportunities when you're Mm -hmm. home. Some of those opportunities are start a garden, if you have the space, right? Because you're home, right. you can actually watch something grow and put water on it when it needs it and, you know, yep. tend to it. That's useful. And you can also, if you think you might have an interest, you know, set up a little space in your house, get a good mic yep. and practice doing a podcast. Or, I mean, for some people, it's not a podcast. It's, you know, they want to practice doing a TV show or they want to practice doing right. interviews. And so, yeah, it is a good opportunity to say one hour of this day is going to be spent on content creation. Now, what that is exactly, I don't know, but what a great opportunity to experiment. Right, right. And, you know, I think we're in this weird golden era, I'd like to say, of independent content creation, just like this this podcast. You should have saw me, my first episode, my second episode. I do not like being in front of the camera. I do not like public speaking, but I forced myself to do it. And it was like, no, you know, I can't go out and network. I can't do events and things like that that I used to do. And I forced myself, okay, well, you've got to learn this. And I think I turned out all right so far. I think it's pretty great. Yeah, yeah good. Thank you for the validation. I think <laughs> pushing yourself out there, right, is exactly right. Mm-hmm. I, I, you know, especially if it has a value to your organization. Yeah. You know, I don't think it's, I don't think it's enough to say, well, I don't like returning people's phone calls. I run a production <laughs> company. All I do is return people's phone calls, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, and, and hopefully you hope when that you return their phone call, they say, fantastic. We'd like to go do this deal. But, you know, it's just because it's something you don't particularly want to do. It doesn't mean that you, you, you're not going to do it just because, you know, because you're the CEO, you are going to do it. So yeah, I think you're exactly right. And I'm like you, my mindset is around how do I utilize this time? What can I do? And sometimes the answer is I'm going to read a trashy book and I'm going to sit down (laughs) and I'm going to wrap myself in a blanket and, you know, or play with my puppy. Um, And sometimes the answer is, you know, there's something that we need to grow in the company and this is the time to experiment. Well, I was just watching Selena on Netflix. So, man, I love that show. (laughs) But uh, anyways, yeah, I mean, that that's really good advice there that you're giving. Now, how does all this independent content, how do you think that you know, shapes up or or impacts the more mainstream media type companies, because it it, it is like I was saying, like a golden era, a new era of media is coming out to where my show, it's niche content created for our, you know, young executives out there that are trying to grow their businesses, grow their careers, which is something that you just can't, you know, flip onto the TV, very easy to find the same content you're going to find somebody like Tony Robbins instead. So how do you think that shakes up the the mainstream media? Yeah, listen, people steal great ideas all the time. And so I think it does influence. I think people see, say, oh, wow, this is the audience that's out there. Oh, this is a great conversation that's out Mm -hmm. there, right? So you influence, I mean, you see it all the time when there's somebody who sort of, uh, Sarah Cooper, the comedian uh, who started on Twitter, 
Um, yeah. And she would do her own voice, you know, or acting really out what President Trump was doing, mm-hmm. kind of, you know, her thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you see what she was, and she's been a comedian for a long time. So that's not where she started. But I think she was able to leverage a moment and grow an audience. Mm-hmm. And I think she was really, um, I think she opened people's minds up to like, oh, this could be funny. This could be interesting. You could use right. Twitter in this way, in a way that other people weren't doing. And oh, yeah, she definitely. was the first. And so she was kind of genius. And now others have done it. And also she's been able to leverage that right into her next thing, a Netflix special, uh, you know, right. all kinds of opportunities. So I, I think that to me would be a really good example of somebody who's everybody was watching and, you know, they, and, they, and, and they were looking at Twitter and saying, oh, this person's rising up. This, this is mm-hmm. catching on. There's an audience there for this kind of thing, whether right. this kind of thing is um, being a comedian on Twitter or this kind of thing is giving advice to business people. Um, right. I think that's, I think that this happens all the time. I mean, oh, when yeah. I worked in, in network news, you know, we would look at local newspapers to see, you know, what was the story <laughs> here in Alabama? What was happening? Okay, now let's go to Texas. What's happening in Oklahoma? What's happening in New Jersey? Because, you know, we weren't going to get on a, in a car and drive out there and bump into stories. We were going to read about them and see how someone else was covering that story. When when you think back, you know, back to, to those days, your earlier days in the industry, Compared to now, it's kind of crazy how far the technology has come along and how everything's digitally transformed. I mean, we're going to be producing, you know, uh, 1440p podcast episode out of one of your rooms and my rooms while we're both uh, a couple hundred miles apart, you know, Uh, it's it's pretty insane. When I started working in local news in 1987, we had two microwave trucks at WBZ TV and only certain reporters could be live, right? Certain yep. people went live and other people didn't go live. They would go out and they'd report their story. They'd come back, they'd put it together and it would air, but there were certain people who'd be live. By the time I got to CNN 20 years later, everybody was live all the time. Literally every, I, I would anchor live from the field. Sometimes 11 hours at a time. I just, if it was breaking news, sure. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, when we, in the pandemic, I was shooting uh, my show, Matter of Fact, from my bedroom. My two boys, my sons, my twins, who were 16, were my photographers, my tech crew, (laughs) very reluctantly, I might add. And they were, uh, you know, and they were amazing. And, And, you know, and we, and all these ideas about, well, you need a studio like this and you need lighting like this and you need, yeah. I, you know, I was doing my own hair and makeup in my bedroom and the lighting was good enough and the <laughs> show was doing great. So yeah, I think it's really changed how we, again, like having new ideas open up because people work from home. I think mm-hmm. you get this idea of like, oh, all these things we assumed, you know, don't have to be true. Maybe we could all be reporting from some space in our house. Right. Why not? I mean, people seem to deal with it just fine. Everybody gets, you know, no one's, no, you know, there was always a group of people, I know you know this, who would say, no one will listen to a podcast if you're sitting yeah. in your house. That would be absurd. Mm-hmm. It needs to have a professional. You need to be in a studio somewhere, yep. you know, where you're in there and you book two hours. Well, that's obviously not the case anymore. So I, I do think no. technology and also just the fact that we've been doing it differently has forced everybody into a innovative mindset because we had to innovate. Yeah. You know, again, just the way that things are and it's great. I mean, look at zoom, look at teams, just how much these all existed pre pandemic. Look how much they've advanced though during the pandemic because all, you know, eyes and ears are, are on the program and that's just one aspect of it. When I first started doing the podcast, Uh, which was what, last July, it was a little bit tough because nobody, you know, there wasn't really good interviewing software that would record at a super high quality. Now Zoom lets you record it in HD. So now I'm using Zoom. So it's come a long way, I think. And also user friendly, right? I mean, the idea that you can just send someone a link and all they have to do is click on a link 
you know, they don't have to listen. Step one. (laughs) (laughs) Plus, everybody knows how to do it now, though, too. Pre-pandemic, you had the issues. I would set up a digital conference call and you'd always have people. They don't know how to log on. They can't get their mic to work. Now you don't have that. People know it's embedded in us. Yep. 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 So we do got to get wrapping up, although this has been fabulous. This has been amazing. Got, I guess, two quick questions for you before we roll. First one is, uh, now this is funny, but how do I get a newscaster voice? I've got to <laughs> ask because whenever I hear your stories, like if I see a news headline playing in my head, I swear it is like exactly like your voice. Like I would That's see hilarious. your videos. I grew up in Long Island, so I don't know yeah. where I got this voice. I actually, uh-huh. when I was at NBC News, they had me work with a, a voice lady. She actually has a new book out. Okay. I can't remember the name of it. Um, but it's all about using your voice. And uh, I was always a pretty good enunciator, but I was from Long Island. So I said, like, yeah. close to the wall, you know. Uh, <laughs> and she would have me do, you know, mum, 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 and vocal exercises to lose both my accent and also to work on my enunciation. Um, I just think it's, you know, I don't think everybody needs a newscaster voice. I think everybody (laughs) needs a voice that is themselves. Otherwise, right? right? Like you just want to sound like you and you want to sound like the best version of you that makes you comfortable to sound like. So I would, I'd argue for that rather than ever changing your voice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get it. I get it. I'm just not a big fan of my voice. You should see me trying to edit these. I'm cringing. That's part of the reason why I just, Force they send it, it to off. My son That's why I never edit my stuff. I send it right off to someone who does it and they pick and oh, choose. Good. I am not alone. And I, I also wanted to know, you know, to wrap up here that, you know, we'll let you talk about your, your show and stuff like that then too, is tell us a fun story, you know, a fun story. <laughs> maybe nobody knows. Let's hear something fun. A fun story. Uh, okay, I'll tell you a fun story. Go I ahead. decided, because I'm 55 this year, and this has <laughs> nothing to do with my show, um, but uh, my fun story is I am 55 this year, and so I've been writing a list of all the things that I wanted to do this year for yeah. fun. Um, because often my goals are very, like, I need to accomplish this, and I need to accomplish that. And so I bought a boat, a sunfish. I don't know if you sail at all, ever, but a sunfish mm-hmm. out on the East Coast, yeah, especially in New England, New York area. It's very I, I paid nine hundred dollars for my boat uh, and secondhand boat. And um, it's a little it's a one sail, adorable, yeah. little two person, little dinghy type thing. Wow. And so a girlfriend and I bought this boat and we are going to learn how to sail this summer. That is our goal. And it's one of about 10 things on my list of things to accomplish this summer that have nothing to do with work and nothing to do with anything other than learning a new skill and having fun. Ah, no, that's great. And I think that's really important for people to remember too. It goes back to what we were talking about a little bit ago where, you know, you have to also have fun at life to, to be fulfilled or else you're going to be miserable. You know, eventually at some point in your life, you will be. Yeah, Maybe absolutely. not immediately. Yeah, a hundred percent. No, I, and and I have a really a fun friend. She's about the same age as I am, and we were like, you know what? I've always wanted to learn how to sail and sunfish. For people who don't know, it's like the boat they teach teenagers out here. I grew up in Long Island, so everybody you know learned how to sail in some capacity yeah. or you know paddleboard, and so it's a very easy boat. Like in three hours, you can learn how to sail a sunfish. So I've got to get a refresher course because I haven't been on a sunfish for about forty years oh wow Um, but uh, yeah it's been a while (laughs) so we are going to take our sunfish lessons and really have a good you know 55 summer that's Uh, my plan this year that's awesome can you tell us real quick then about your your shows that are out there absolutely Uh, you know what i do running a production company is we produce a lot of content generally Mm -hmm. but but consistently, I am a correspondent for HBO Real Sports, so we're working on a story yep. right now uh, that looks at, um, really, at the core of it is just how badly uh, minor league ball players are treated and what you can do to wow. help them to make it into the major leagues. And sometimes that's around gathering data about their abilities. 
And then um, for a matter of fact, which I anchor, which is a show I produce along with Hearst Television, which is a syndicated Sunday morning show, mm -hmm. uh, we just take a look at sort of what's happening. I wouldn't really say it's not political. It's more around how policy affects people in real lives. Right. I think today political is this person on this side yells at this person on this side. Yeah. And, and we're much more about explaining what policy means to actual people. So both of those things are the things that we do consistently. And uh, so everybody should check those out. Oh, definitely. A hundred percent. Are you, are you happy that you came on, did an interview on the, uh, on the podcast with zero talks of politics? I know it was kind of nice. Yeah. Yeah. I that's what like we should that. do. Yeah. It's very nice. Very nice. <laughs> and just so you remember too, with your production company, if you ever need new talent, you know, shark bite biz is available. It's a deal. <laughs> Good to know. Thank you. Hey, thank you so me. much. This has been amazing. And if you just hold on for one quick second, um, but definitely check out our show. And thank you again, Soledad. My pleasure. Wow. Amazing chat with Soledad, right? Like, seriously, incredible. First, y'all know the routine. If you found this interview helpful, if it sparked those warm and fuzzies, do me a favor. Hit that like button, smash that subscribe button. But if you really want to help us out, okay, let's get Soledad and Sharkbite Biz. Let's get trending. Share this out to your social media. Get it out there on Twitter, on LinkedIn, on Facebook, wherever you are on the interwebs. Do us a favor. Help us grow the channel. Share this out. Now, I want to say I usually joke about me being the rock star wannabe. In fact, I think I said it on the intro. But I tell you what. Soledad, she is the real deal. She is the rock star. Like I said during the intro, she embodies everything that represents success. We recorded that interview at like uh, 4 p.m. or so that day. And I think that she was telling the story that that same day she had to catch a flight at 4 a.m. or got up at 4 a.m. or something like that. But she's been going nonstop and she does that every day. That is the drive I was talking about in the introduction. You may think you have drive, but can you do a flight that early? work all day, in and out of meetings, go to an interview with me, which I have to add is taxing upon itself, and then probably still have work to do afterwards, okay? And we're not talking about just doing that once or twice. This is a regular occurrence for a person that is at the level that Soledad O'Brien's at, and it's amazing, and yet she still finds time for family throughout the whole thing. It's incredible, and that type of work ethic is really what separates the top 1% of producers and the rest of us. As much as I always think that I'm always working, she puts me to shame. I'll admit it. And it actually is inspiring to me, and it really drives me because after talking with her and seeing how she does things and hearing some of these stories, I'll admit it's like, wow, David, you could be doing this much more better. And I'm going to put a little action plan because, you know, like before, I used to wake up 5 a.m. I was a 5 a.m.er. And then the pandemic hit, broke the routine. You know, I didn't see needing to get up that early. And, you know, it really is true. You get more done during the day when you maximize the amount of hours that you can actually do things. I did think it was kind of cool about how Sully Dad agreed with me, you know, to a degree, about the nine to five workday for some roles being antiquated. It's all about deliverables these days. If you listen to this show, you're probably a working professional, an owner, manager, director, young executive, somebody in that type of position. And it really becomes down to are you or are you not doing the job? And like she said, I think it really depends on the position. But we've realized as a society that we can do things outside of that nine to five work zone area. And people can have the flexibility and still not only complete tasks, but also kick total butt while doing those tasks. But lastly, I want to talk about content creation. So they that easily the queen of creating content. But, you know, she did tell us about how hard it is to maintain that status. Think of all the travel she just did the past couple of weeks as things are starting to pick back up as we hopefully are transforming into more of a post-COVID world. 
And it's it's something that's very taxing on your mind, on your body. You've got to be able to pick up and go. But that's with her doing a big national slash international type presence for all these major media companies and with her own production company. It is different than the personal branding aspect of it. And that's why I wanted to bring this up. There has never been a time like right now to be an independent creator, to be able to get your personal brand, your voice out there to the masses, the availability, the easiness. Seriously, it's never been easier. This podcast reaches tens of thousands of people between YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, all those different places. And it's because of how easy it is to be able to create content that just never has been there before. And it was kind of cool because she does respect independent creators. That's why she ended up coming onto the show, which was really amazing experience for me to be able to interview somebody like Soledad. So I, I do just want on a last final note, give a personal thank you out to Soledad for her time. She is a super busy, famous executive. And for her to give me 40 minutes at the end of the day, like what she had, I mean, to me, that's amazing. I'm very grateful, super excited that she told me about a side of her that not many people get to see. We got to see the behind the scenes look at Soledad. We heard about the tater tot loving sailboating mother that just, you know, struggled just as much as we all did during this pandemic. And, you know, it was really it was really good to hear this story from her and how she's handled things. I mean, even with creating content, using her kids to help with the lighting and stuff like that. Same thing that I'm doing with this show, my now 18 year old Pancho producing the show. So it was really cool to hear that there's a lot of things that she's doing and has done that is just similar like the rest of us. The big difference though is, is I think the drive that she has, the ability to get up at 4 a.m. and work 12, 16 hours a day and be, you know, operating at extremely high level. She has that type of drive in her. And that really is the difference that puts her in the top 1%, I think, compared to, to the rest of us. And really, if you're looking at this, if you're hearing that story, I hope it motivates you. It motivates me. And I've learned so much from just 40 minutes. Uh, talking with her. It, it's been an incredible experience. So thank you so much again for that. Totally that. Today's question of the day for YouTube is what surprised you the most about Soledad? Was it that she loved tater tots? Was it that she bought a sailboat? Okay, leave your comment below. Let's discuss. Love to hear what you all have to say. Remember, if you want to be on the show, just like Soledad O'Brien was, Send an email, interviews at sharkbitebiz.com. We are pretty full for this year, but I'm working on maybe doing live streams or a third episode. So I want to have, you know, a lot of people to fill that content up with. Remember again, join the channel. It's three bucks to become a uh, baby shark here on the channel. Do it on YouTube. If not, go to deadhousecoffee.com. Use code SHARK, 20% off, and it helps us right here with this channel. Once again, remember, I'm David Strasser. This is Shark Bite Biz. We'll see you all next episode. Cheers. Thank you for listening to Shark Bite Biz. We hope you got some insightful info from this podcast. Be sure to subscribe to us through your favorite podcast app and visit us on the web at www.sharkbitebiz.com. How has business changed for you in the 20s? Email us at podcast at sharkbitebiz.com so you can join us and share your story.